Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the launch of CEE's Biennial Survey of the States. Today's event will be a panel discussion from state treasurer all the way down to the student level about the changes in economic and personal finance standards across the country. We'll follow this panel discussion with some audience Q&A, so please feel free to submit your questions at any time using the Zoom Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Without further ado, I'd like to now share a video message from CEE's new board chair, Rebecca Patterson. Hello, I'm Rebecca Patterson, chair of the board of the Council for Economic Education, and I'm pleased to kick off this year's survey of the state's results. CEE, the Council for Economic Education, has a clear and critical mission to equip K through 12 students with the economic and financial knowledge they need to make better decisions for themselves, their families, and their communities. What we see today is a widening gap between what people actually know and what they need to know to make solid decisions for their futures. CEE is trying to close that gap with programming for students, their families, and teachers that have gone back now over 70 years and touched literally millions and millions of students. I'd like now to introduce you to Nan Morrison, President and CEO of the Council for Economic Education. Nan is gonna share key takeaways from the latest survey of the state's results. Thank you, Rebecca, from afar. Good afternoon and welcome to everybody. As you know, this is our release of the 2020 survey of the states. And I must say that it is quite meaty, even if the news is less than stellar. Well, less than stellar is the new normal. As Rebecca said, every two years, we undertake a rigorous study of the status of economic and personal finance education in each of our states to evaluate where access improve, is improving and where it is not. State requirements are one avenue for ensuring broad ads, access to these subjects. That is a top-down strategy, but not the only avenue. This year's survey draws attention to the broad bottom-up up efforts in places like Nebraska that eventually led to a breakthrough, the passage of its first statewide educational requirement in personal finance. And Nebraska State Treasurer is here today and will tell us more. This year's report also points to the disparate impact of funding and getting quality education to our kids, where it reinforces inequities. In sum, we found that over the last two years, economic education has just about fallen off the radar and that the momentum in personal finance education looks like it's slowing down, though there may be some good news in the offing. As I said initially, this is a media report and I'm very proud of the discipline, intellectual honesty and rigor that my team brings to this endeavor. Why do it if it doesn't count? In the effort to resolve multi-generational equity issues for our kids and communities, access to these subjects must get the attention that it deserves. To be blunt, we know that children from professional families, upper and middle class and wealthy, are exposed to the vocabulary of finance and economics at home. It is normal for most of them. They know where Wall Street is and what it offers, they know what compound interest does for their savings or not. They know that a credit card can be a pit of debt. This is ordinary knowledge for those children, not extraordinary. We need it to be ordinary knowledge for all of our kids. What is necessary for surviving and prospering in a modern economy, a roadmap for each and beacon for all. As noted in our report, this education is also critical in bringing optimism and change to persistent societal problems. Economics and personal finance teach students how to analyze, how to find pertinent information, how to evaluate data, how to identify gaps in their own knowledge and seek out other perspectives. In short, these are tools in transforming arguments in defense of predetermined positions into shared and aspirational civic effort, into hope, resolve, and action. This iteration of our survey is a reflection of a national inflection point. Will we become serious? Will we give our kids the experience that knowledge matters, that skills are available? Will we demonstrate that we are rooting for them, enough to commit ourselves to the hard work, moving the states to set these subjects among their priorities? Thankfully, we also have a corporate champion in this work. Visa is not only sponsoring the, 20, the 2022 survey, it is leading and funding a new effort to get personal finance to our kids, FinEd 50. We are truly honored to partner with them and a coalition of private, public, and nonprofit leaders 
and improving access for students in target states. One of Visa's executives, who I'm proud to call my colleague, will discuss this new initiative after our panel. Needless to say, we all feel that finally the wind is at our backs. Now it is time to introduce some, someone whom most of you already know, the redoubtable Karen Feinerman, who graciously agreed to moderate our panel discussion today. Karen is the co-founder and CEO of Metropolitan Capital Advisors, a New York-based hedge fund. She's also a member of the CNBC financial news show, Fast Money, and a widely respected author. She is a board member of the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research and a trustee of Montefiore Medical Center. She was an honoree at our Visionary Awards Benefit in 2012 and has hosted our National Personal Finance Challenge. I'm just breathless reading it. We are grateful for her generosity and kindness and being with, and being with us here today. Karen? Thank you, Nan. I'm, I'm very happy to be here, and I am always so impressed and thankful for the work that you do with CE. It's very important work, and you're a great champion for it, so thank you. Um, so I am lucky to be here with a number of panelists that bring a lot to this discussion, which is so important, so let me introduce them right now. In terms of statewide advocacy efforts, all of our panelists represent key levers in moving personal finance and economic education forward. Our first is Mike Raymer, the Executive Director of the Georgia Council of Economic Education. CEE's state councils drive the work on the advocacy front. There is simply no other effective way of doing this. And Mike has developed and fostered key corporate foundation and political relationships in order to get traction for these efforts. He is a former Georgia Partnership for, for Excellence in Education Fellow and is a well-respected leader in his field. So Mike, thank you for being here. Next, we have John Moranti. He was elected Nebraska State Treasurer in 2018. And in terms of advocacy, there are no better state champions for this education than dedicated state treasurers. And John is exactly that. He is very much a man of his place and community. He is the former president of the iconic Big Fred's Pizza in Omaha. And John changed gears in 2012 and was elected to the Nebraska legislature. And now that is his current position. His involvement in his state and community is broad and deep. Much of CEE's advocacy efforts over the years have been led by remarkable students. One of these is here today, Mia Shenanga a junior at East Greenwich High in Rhode Island. She is the co-founder and co-president of Rhode Island's first chapter of Invest in Girls, a CEE program focused on increasing financial literacy for high school girls. Mia is also a formidable athlete in several sports and an advanced cellist. She was a semi-finalist in last year's CEE's National Personal Finance Challenge. So welcome Mia and also welcome John. And finally, one of CEE's own, Chris Caltabiano. Chris oversees all domestic programs, a portfolio that includes the online and offline content, as well as teacher professional development and much more. He also manages CEE's advocacy activities in the national and state level. Earlier in his career, he worked for the International Rescue Committee and prior to that, the Peace Corps. Service has been the center of his life's work for a long time now. And we certainly benefit from that. And thank you for that service. And Chris, glad to be here with you. So I thought I would start with you, Chris, since we introduced you at the end. Um, so let's start with the, the survey itself, the data. So are there any surprises to the data? I think there are, I know what they might be. And is there any interesting sort of second level data that you can glean from the survey? Great, thanks, Karen, uh, and uh, thanks everyone for being here today. Uh, a, a couple of maybe surprises, maybe not. I think the biggest surprise is is just, frankly, progress, but very, very slow progress. And I think the second part of that sentence is particularly important. Uh, when we do this survey, we look at both whether the the states have uh, a, uh, some sort of set of standards in place in both economics and personal finance, as well as whether they require those standards to be taught in some way with really the kind of the, the top uh, the top of the heap being those that, that dedicate a course 
that is required for graduation. Uh, and, and what we saw this year, uh, and I'll focus on that last data point, is um, there was no change in the number of states that require uh, economics for graduation uh, than there were two years ago. We continue to be at 25 states. On the personal finance side, there was some increase. There was increase, an increase of two states. So we now have 23 states across the country that are requiring personal finance for graduation. Um, but again, less than stellar, as Nan said. If we increased uh, personal finance uh, at the rate we're doing right now, it would be more than a quarter century before every single kid in America were receiving personal finance education. And the same, sadly, is even worse uh, with, with economics since it's not moving at all. Um, and that economics really is at a standstill. We've seen almost no movement in over a decade. There's only a couple of additional states that have personal or have economics requirements than there were a few years ago. And I look forward to, to, to Mike saying more about that from a state that's actually um, looking to re potentially reverse their requirements, sad to say. A um, couple of other surprises to me is that there are still some states that don't even have fundamental standards in place for personal finance in their states. Uh, what that says to me is those states don't even think it merits uh, being taught to students. Personal finance education is something that these states don't even think is something that their students should be getting, which I find ridiculous. And by the way, the biggest state in the country, California, is one of those states. Uh, the last thing that I would point out um, to be a little bit more optimistic uh, with some of this is that there has been some positive movement within personal finance around that dedicated course for graduation, that real robust one semester uh, level of coursework in personal finance. Uh, we've only been tracking kind of this distinction for the last uh, six or eight years, um, and we, but we have seen movement. And this year there are nine states that actually have a dedicated full semester personal finance requirement, which is three states up from, la from, from two years ago. So that is some positive news. Uh, and there is some legislation on Governor DeSantis's desk as we speak uh, in the state of Florida that could actually add Florida to that list as well. So um, uh, let's, all, let's all root for uh, Governor DeSantis uh, putting his signature on that bill. So those are a, a, couple of the, a couple of the next level details within the survey. And um, I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Karen, so that we can uh, hear from some of our other panelists. Well, so just back on this, so Florida would be the most populous state, which certainly helps even if we don't get all 50 to get as many people educated as, as possible. I'm surprised to hear that California is not, not on that list. Um, so over the past decade though, how, how has the momentum changed? Yeah, so yeah, well, on, on the economic side, sadly, there is no momentum. And, um, and, and that's something that I think that, that we as, as advocates for this work have a lot more work to do. Uh, on the personal finance side, there has been slow progress. Uh, you know, one state every two years, maybe two states every two years. So we have seen, we have seen movement over a longer course of time. So I have some optimism there that that will continue. Although again, if it continues at one or two states every two years, uh, you know, we're, we're gonna we're gonna hit the half century mark or beyond before we know that all, all that all, all students across the country are receiving this economic or this this sort of education. So, what are you hoping for realistically in 2024? Maybe even a little bit optimistically, and how do we get there for that survey? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I mean, I, what I hope for is big increases on both sides. Uh, it, it's as simple as that. Uh, how do we get there? I think. Uh, some of the people that you see on this panel are, are prime movers in making that happen. We have talented uh, uh, nonprofit professionals such as Mike and, and colleagues like his around the country who, who can help legislators understand the best sorts of, uh, and, and not just the legislators, but also those in departments of education, what makes the most sense and what, what really will move the ball. We have, we have great folks like, like treasurers. We have Treasurer Moranti here. Who can who, who who kind of know the, the the inside world of what happens on a little bit, and who can be very strong advocates for this? And frankly, having having folks like Nia, and not just her, but but people like her parents, uh, who are community members and vocal voices, uh, having those students and parents really pushing for this education and and helping helping those that that can make a difference understand that this is important for them and for their kids. Uh, for their educations going forward. I think it's going to take that effort of all of these different constituencies working together and speaking with one voice to, to really move that forward. Mm -hmm. So let me turn now to John. It's people like John that are going to help move that mission forward. 
Um, welcome, John. There is a, um, a piece in this year's survey of states regarding Nebraska's recent legislative success in requiring personal finance requirements. Tell me about more of that process. How did you, how did you get this to happen? Sure. So first of all, thanks for having me. Um, we have been fighting in, uh, through the treasurer's office for a number of years to create uh, personal finance and financial liter literacy education as a requirement to graduate from high school. We've had great partners through the Nebraska Bankers Association, Nebraska Credit Union League, and, and many others who have been fighting for this uh, for, for many years. What really helped us get it over the finish line this year uh, was we had, or last year, was we had two state senators from very, very different backgrounds. We had uh, a very progressive Democrat representing a majority African-American district in North Omaha. And then we had a, one of the most conservative Republican legislators uh, representing rural Nebraska, uh, who came together to introduce two separate companion pieces of legislation uh, to get it brought to the education committee. Um, and both made kind of comparable arguments as to how the current system was set up to benefit many of the districts which had a lot of resources, got resources from the state through, the, through state aid to schools, were already having personal finance uh, curriculum in some form or fashion. Some of them from the school district level had already implemented uh, graduation requirements. But if you were from a school district that didn't have these resources, whether it be rural Nebraska or urban Omaha, this, this sort of curriculum was left behind. Uh, so these two senators got together uh, went to the education committee that the, the two bills, one creating the graduation requirement, the other creating curriculum standards, or creating the, the requirement that the Department of Education create uh, curriculum standards, uh, they ended up getting merged. And where we had failed in the past, those two really got it over the finish line. So uh, it was able, they were able to sort of overcome the, the typical opposition that any sort of curriculum requirement, regardless of the subject matter, um, comes into in the legislative process, and they ended up uh, passing it overwhelmingly. It was really a great thing. That is a great thing. I'm kind of surprised, and uh, it's nice to hear a bipartisanship on a difficult issue that on its own is hard to change. That That's great. Um, so when I think about for a blueprint for others, what is there anything that you really should, you, that you avoided that was the third rail that you think could blow up this opportunity for other states to try to do the same thing? Um, well, I would certainly avoid um, making the issue partisan or, or as depoliticized as possible, because sometimes in today's climate, things, the, the rhetoric ratchets up so quickly uh, that things spiral out of control and the coalitions that you try and build in, in an interim can fall apart very, very easily. But at the end of the day, we were able to put together a coalition of testifiers in favor of the bill. Uh, in both of uh, both bills, which kind of ran the gamut, it included the Bankers Association and the ACLU, uh, Credit Union Leagues and the, and the university. So institutions which wouldn't normally have a lot of overlap politically um, uh, were able to come together on something like this. So to the extent there are rails to avoid, it's to, to try and turn down the temperature as much as, much as possible make it depoliticized and nonpartisan to the extent that that's possible. We're unique in Nebraska in that we have a nonpartisan one house legislature. So it's, a, it's maybe a little bit easier for us to do that. Sometimes we don't always do as good of a job as we could, but uh, uh, that I, I think is probably the, the key to getting out something like this over the finish line. Mm -hmm. So in terms of what, what to avoid and what, what to do, I hear some of that, but how do you get started if you're a treasurer and you, you, you wanna, you're starting from nowhere? You don't really have any support nor do you have any objection, just it's not on the radar screen for most. How do you get started? So for, uh, from the perspective of a state treasurer, a lot of us already do financial literacy in some form or fashion through our office. So for example, our office, uh, offers a free software program, the EverFi, <clears throat> the EverFi system, which I'm, I'm sure a lot of folks on here are familiar with. We offer it free of charge to parents, school districts, uh, teachers, and kids all across the state of Nebraska. So we already had a sort of understanding of the importance of financial literacy, but making sure that every kid in our state graduated on a level playing field, that if you, you didn't have better financial skills, if you happen to come from a school district with more resources, um, we had that sort of a background. Getting started 
the National Association of State Treasurers has lots of resources. NAS.org has lots of resources on what states are doing. We have our own sort of survey of the states as to what, what's happening in, in state treasurer's offices across the country. Um, and uh, there are a lot of uh, things out there that, that treasurers are trying to lead the way on. Thanks, John. We need a lot more John Moronte uh, treasurers out there. Um, let me shift gears a little bit. Um, Mia. Mia is our student, they're our only student here. Um, so tell me a little bit about your journey and your advocacy for financial literacy. How did that happen? Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, my journey on financial literacy really started during my sophomore year. I was sort of unexpectedly thrown into a personal finance elective. It hadn't been one I had put on my elective sheet. I really wasn't I didn't know a lot about the class or anything that was going to be addressed in it, but I quickly realized that it was probably the most practical class that I've ever taken in my high school and career before then. Financial literacy is crucial regardless of what field you want to pursue. So as I continued through personal finance and worked with my, very closely with my teacher to establish the first chapter in Rhode Island of Investing Girls at my school, because only 12% of high school girls feel confident making their own financial decisions by the time they graduate. And that's a, that was a really alarming statistic to me because all those who are underrepresented need to be empowered to be independent as adults and after they graduate high school. So as I worked to compete in the National Personal Finance Challenge and establish this chapter, I learned more about financial literacy and also about how to advocate for it. I'm a huge advocate that all, all girls, everyone, all high schoolers should understand finance and understand how to make their own decisions. Because as Nan said earlier, you make, you, you learn critical thinking, you learn analysis. All these skills are crucial in addition to everything that is really important that you know about finance as you go into your future. So as I've worked with Investing Girls and very closely with Dr. Page, my personal finance teacher, who has been a huge supporter and really helped me get to where I am, um, I've learned to become an advocate and also really understand how important financial literacy is, regardless of what field you want to pursue in the future. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. I'm glad we, glad we have girls like you out there, students like you. Um, do you have any advice for students who might want to get involved with financial literacy and uh, how would they get started? Absolutely. I think that really the most important thing is understanding why it's important to you and then finding people who think the same way you do. Having a mentor, having peers who really care about advocacy and financial literacy as much as you do, that support system has helped me been able to establish the first chapter of Investing Girls and working with their staff and all of the other people who really care about the cause as much as I do, having that those people around you and hearing their opinions and what they think would be the best next best steps, that's how I think you manage to advocate for something and how you can get more people involved in financial literacy. When you're surrounded by people who care about it and you have that ability to broadcast why it's important, that's how we can get more people involved and expand financial literacy and really up that 12% or in any program where advocacy is a big part of it. Well, I, I love your passion. Just out of curiosity, what was the other elective that you were hoping to get into? Um, I think it was biotech, but I ended up in my Spanish class conflicted, so I ended up in <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, glad for that serendipitous turn. Um, yeah, last, well. I want to turn to, to, to Mike. Um, what is going on with economic education? Why do you think there is that, this stagnation in progress? Thanks, Karen. I think a lot of it has to do with uh, just folks like me and, and, and other councils and centers across the country. We've not been doing a good enough job advocating for the importance of teaching economics and why it's so important for students in high school and middle school and elementary school to learn economics. Another part of it, I think, is this: there, there's, there's a push, and we've been talking about this, a push to mandate more and more personal finance courses. And speaking of Georgia, uh, there's in, in Georgia high schools, students only have three years of social studies and both personal finance and economics fall within social studies. So if we're gonna add a personal finance course, something has to give. Um, and, and oftentimes it's economics is the, is the course that kind of gets pushed out. And we ran into that in the last legislative session in 2021. There were indications that um, the state was gonna mandate a personal finance course in 10th or 11th grade. And that set off some, some alarms here at the Georgia Council because we, we figured well, something's going to have to go, and it's not going to be U.S. history. It's not going to be government. It's not going to be world history. It's probably going to be economics. 
So we really are trying to stay on top of it and promote economics as a, as a, as a way of thinking. Uh, it's a way to make your life better. If you have a, a pretty sound economic under, understanding of economics, I think you can make better decisions. And that's what we're trying to stress uh, with, with teachers and parents and students throughout the state. Mm -hmm. um, you started Economics Education Month last, last year, I guess it was. What, what, would, what kind of response did you get to that? Yeah, so it's been great. So we started, uh, me, uh, a colleague in Nebraska and another colleague in Oklahoma, we were talking last summer and we, we, we all were kind of sharing these same concerns about economics sort of being pushed aside. And we got to talking about Financial Literacy Month in April and how popular it was and everybody's always talking about it and it's on the news. And we said, why don't we have an Economic Education Month? And all three of us said, well, it already has to exist. There has to be such a thing already. And, and we looked and we're like, no, it doesn't. So let's start it. So starting in July, we put it together and said it's going to be in October. It's six months away from Financial Literacy Month. It's the same month as the Council for Economic Education uh, Conference. And we started it. And within two months, we have uh, 13 different states got proclamations from the governors saying that October is, is Economic Education Month in those states. And we really had a great response. There's a lot of social media, a lot of sharing of resources, fun student competitions. And it was we couldn't have been happier with with putting together this thing in two months. And we know that the, the 2022 version is going to be even better. I'm, I'm surprised, not surprised. It's interesting. It's a Midwestern coalition there of, uh, that got you, got you started. Um, yeah. you're, you're getting teachers in Georgia involved in advocacy for economics education. How are they getting involved and what are your goals there? Yeah, so we put together in response to, you know, the, 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 the push to have more personal finance and less economics. We realize that we, we have to have teachers out there advocating for the importance of economic education. I live in a state that's home to 16 Fortune 500 companies. The, the film industry is booming here. The tech industry is booming here. We have two deep water ports that are like setting records every year. And we really want to highlight the, the great things that are happening in economics classrooms to teach about those kinds of things and relate to students so that when students graduate from high school, they're prepared for a future here in Georgia. We want them to stay in Georgia and work in Georgia. And I think by, by learning more economics, they're going to be more prosperous and they're going to make the state more prosperous. And that's what we want. So we've got right now, we've got 19 teachers spread across the state who are connecting with their local school paper, their, their local paper, their school board members, both local and state and their legislators and inviting them into their classrooms to see what's going on in economics classrooms across the state because it's really exciting, fantastic stuff these teachers are doing that relates directly to the success of Georgia's economy. Hey, Karen, if I could jump in here for a second. Yeah, please. Um, I just please. wanted to, 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 to reiterate something that Mike said. There's a reason that the Council for Economic Education does a survey of the states for both economics and personal finance. We do not believe that this is an either or proposition. We think it's critical that both that students get both in their in their in their education career. We we believe strongly that there is room for it in the curriculum, uh, and that that this is what we should be pushing for. So to Mike's credit, to say personal finance great, but to but but we can't lose economics in the process. I think that's a really important message that that, that I, I want to make sure people get from this. Mm -hmm. right. Karen, I'll, I'll finish. I was lucky enough to teach high school economics for nine years, and the course I taught had personal finance and economics in it. And I always taught basic economic concepts first because I couldn't imagine jumping right into personal finance. And I got to back up with what Chris just said. That's what we want to see. We want to see students required to take economics and personal finance in Georgia because we know ultimately they're going to be better citizens, better decision makers, and, and, and prepared for a globally interdependent world. No question. I, it's, it's hard to imagine how that isn't seen as crucial, crucial curriculum everywhere. But thank you very much for advancing it. Um, now I want to introduce um, Worku Gaucho, and he is the visa representative this afternoon. He is visa's uh, head of North America, inclusive impact and sustainability. In that role, he leads the company's efforts to drive equitable economic growth in the region. Prior to visa, Mr. Gaucho was a senior political appointee in the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation, where he oversaw a regional portfolio of over $5 billion in impact investments. In the early days of his career, Mr. Gaucho was a senior staffer on the Committee of Foreign Affairs in the U.S. House of Representatives. There he helped draft landmark pieces of legislation that eventually became law, including the Electrify Africa Act and the End Wildlife Trafficking Act. 
just two stops on the path to his current role. Mr. Gaucho is also an adjunct professor at George, Georgetown University School of Foreign Service and a term member of the Council of Foreign Relations and a very busy guy. So we really thank you for being here. Please take the floor. That was a great discussion with the panel. I myself took a lot of notes. I'm just thrilled today to join such a prestigious group of folks solving for the disparities that exist in economic and personal finance education. As Nan mentioned in her opening remarks, today a coalition of private, public, and nonprofit entities join forces to launch FinEd 50. FinEd 50 is striving to ensure that all students in, the, in all 50 states have equitable access to a personal finance course. It builds on Visa's more than 30-year commitment in developing innovative, free, and accessible financial education resources for individuals, businesses, and communities. At Visa, we believe that financial education is a critical pathway to economies that include everyone, everywhere. As we heard today and from the panel discussion, this year's survey has showed some progress, but it's uneven with many external factors influencing whether a student has access to a quality financial education course. The neighborhood you grew up in and your family's tax bracket shouldn't determine your ability to learn important principles of financial education. I just want to spend a few minutes walking through four main components of FinEd 50. First, we're advocating for state level policy that ensures equitable access to a personal finance course for every student. We'll spend time at state houses, at departments of education, at the mayor's offices, to really provide them with research, expertise, and support in advancing this policy agenda. Second, we're striving to institute curriculum that meets the national standards for personal finance education. Research shows that just offering a personal finance education course to check the box actually does a disservice to students. We need to get top-notch personal financial education curriculums into classrooms and to ensure that they're culturally relevant. Third, this is an integral piece of FinEd 50, is supporting our teachers. We're establishing professional development opportunities utilizing innovative funding mechanisms. Teachers are on the front lines and we need them to feel confident in their own abilities to teach personal finance. Fourth and the last piece of FinEd 50 is monitoring and evaluation, supporting the measurement of access to ensure that we are promoting an equitable reach. I'll end with a simple call to action. If you're passionate about ensuring young people have access to a quality financial education course, join FinEd 50. Thanks, Karen. Back okay. to you. Thanks, Warku. Um, all right, so we're going to open up the uh, floor for questions from anyone. Um, so let's go for, for the panel. Please uh, un, unmute yourselves and feel free to jump in the conversation. Um, how can others get involved to support Economic Education Month? Maybe, Mike, I will send that one your way. Sure. I, I think the first thing you can do is, whatever state you're in, see if there's a Council for Economic Education in your state. If there is, contact them because we, we've all worked together. There's more than 20 states working on this and we're sharing a lot of resources. So I would say start there. Uh, if you're in a state that doesn't have a, a council, um, contact me at the Georgia Council or CEE, Chris Caltabiano, um, because we're also working with CEE. So I would start there. Okay, thank you. Um, here's one for Mia. What do you say to another 17 year old, 17 year old girl to get her interested in her financial future if she really hasn't thought about it yet? So I think one of the most important things to realize about finance is that you don't notice how important it is until you like take the class or you talk to your parents about finance and about what that means for you in the future. So talk to your parents, talk to adults in your life who have already manage their own finances and start to understand what that means, whether that's asking about credit cards, getting your first debit card or checking account. You have lots of resources, but you do have to ask and use them. And then also talking, finding out if there's a personal finance teacher at your school, because they can be a great resource for you, along with any of your peers. Really just finance is something we need to be able to talk about so that we can learn about it and be advocates for it. So did you find it, sometimes I hear the reason girls or anyone doesn't want to start learning about it, it's too daunting, it's too scary, it's, you know, it's just a flood of information. How do you address that? 
Well, it absolutely is, is the first thing you know, like the stock market, it's always, there's always going to be risk and you have to kind of go into it knowing that. But I think if you start with the basics and just understand what a checking account is, what a debit card is, if you learn those basics, it just, go, you can just build upon those. It really starts with having that foundation and understanding that finance is important and we need to do our best to understand as much of it as we can. And what we don't understand, we have to ask questions about because there's always more to learn. That is for sure. Um, John, let me ask you, here's a question I think could be for you. What do the leaders need from us to help them make the case and move the needle like you have done? Sure. So I think, first of all, all elected officials need to understand what are the priorities of their constituents. They need to hear from their constituents and understand what's top of mind for them at any given time. We already heard on this call there's I didn't even know that there was necessarily a, a, a friction or a tension between economics, education, or, or financial literacy. That's actually the first time I've heard that sort of dichotomy. So, uh, but reaching out and letting folks know what needs to be prioritized, I think you'll find that every state legislature in the country are going to have legislators who already understand the importance of this sort of curriculum and state treasurers across the country uh, understand it as well. So reaching out to them and knowing that there are uh, citizens and corporations and uh, and high school students who feel that this ought to be a priority, uh, will put it ahead of the pack when it comes to all the other issues that policymakers uh, have to have to decide. Okay. Thank you. Um, Chris, let me ask one for you about, do we have any data on how well students do who have received this education somewhere down the line? I don't know if it's, I don't know, do we have any data on uh, how they do after school for anyone? This question is actually, um, having received personal finance education and those who haven't. Yeah, we actually do. There's been some, I think some really foundational resource research in the last five years on this uh, and typically looking at states uh, that have put a new requirement in place and comparing uh, downstream or longer term outcomes uh, between the students before the requirement was put in place and after the requirement was put in place. And, and what they've seen is four or five years down the road, uh, those students as they become, you know, adult members of society who have received personal finance education after that requirement have better credit scores, tend to default uh, on loans at a lower rate, uh, they tend to, if they're going to college, uh, look at public loan options versus private loan options, which I think we all know tend to have, have more favorable interest rates. Uh, and and, and they, they show these sorts of behaviors that I, I think we would all consider to be positive financial behavior. So, so, so the, there are some, some of these, these data points starting to really be, be honed in on and, and understood in a better way that do show that you know, this does make a difference and it makes a tangible difference in people's lives down the road. I would think so. It's not, it's not surprising, but it, it's obviously good to hear data supporting the mission. Um, um, Mike, I have a question for you. Do you have a story of a former student who benefited from economic education? And I'm guessing you do. Yeah, I've got, I've got thousands. Um, it's funny because I actually started a podcast. I'm not trying to plug my podcast, but I actually interview former students of mine. And we, I talk about what they took away from my class. And it's, it's often a combination between the things I learned about budgeting and the things I learned about the economy. Um, I, you know, I've got a number of students that are they're working in, in your field, um, you know, doctors, lawyers, you name it, I've taught them. But, but I think from talking with these students recently, they all let me know that the, the, the class really helped them think about the broader economy and where they fit in within the economy. And I think that's positive. And I taught these kids oftentimes like 20 years ago. Um, so they're still thinking about economics. It is sort of amazing. I mean, it's, we sort of send them off into the world without the language to be in the understanding the language to be in the world as a grown up. Um, so I'm very happy there's guys like you around. Um, all right, let me see what else do we have here. So, uh, hold on one second. Um, I have one more question for John, actually. From start to finish, how long did that endeavor take for you? 
Oh gosh, I would say the trip, including my predecessor, it was a, at least a seven or eight year uh, project. So it was going back over and over again, um, building stakeholders, building a coalition, but really finding two rock star legislators to, to introduce the bill that, that got it over the finish line. I'm glad you got there. That's a little, that's a long, a long slog. Um, when we're Chris, Chris or Mike, um, is another avenue to reimagine math requirements to include life skills slash knowledge like economics and personal finance? Is that maybe a way uh, to get at it as opposed to algebra, geometry, trig, calculus, which I know I never use, even though I uh, work with numbers all the time? If, if I could start, Chris, uh, right now, the, the, the our legislative session is going on in here in Georgia, and there are rumors that a, a, a personal finance mandate is going to be proposed through math. It hasn't happened yet, so I'll keep my eye on it. But yeah, to me, that sort of a, a makes sense. And that would be the best of both worlds, where again, we'd have students required to take a personal finance course and students required to take an ac um, economics course. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed that it actually comes to pass here in Georgia. Yeah, I, I, I think that, um, I think Nan might have planted this question, if anyone's wondering, by the way. No, that's a joke. But, 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 but I do know that Nan is very, very passionate about, about the, the, the connecting point to math, and, and, and I think she's on to something there. Uh, I, I do think that there are parts of the content standards and economics and personal finance that fit very nicely in within, within the math curriculum. And I think to the extent that we can make that math real, to make people do actual things that they're going to do with their lives with math and, and, and with, with, with equations and, and percentages and statistics and all of those things. I think that that is, that, that, that that is a good thing. Um, I, do, I don't think it serves as a substitute for covering the totality of, of the content in the two courses. So I, I, I wanna see it as part of the solution, but I don't, I, I'm not necessarily sure I would say it's the entire solution. Okay, thank you. Um, this is a funny one. Um, Mia, I think work who just offered you a job at Visa. You want to comment on that? Say yes. Well, I'm <laughs> so happy to be here and grateful for all the support. Okay. Good answer. Okay. Um, here's another one. I think, uh, hold on, hold on. Uh, just went by. Okay. I think that quite a few teachers see the need, but don't feel competent in teaching. And from my experience, that's probably a good thing. Too many quote experts are overconfident. What training is, I don't, edit, I guess maybe to, to Chris or anybody, what training is available for teachers who wanna make a difference? Mike, you wanna start this one? Yeah, so that's what we do. That's our bread and butter here at the Georgia Council on Economic Education. We help teachers teach economics and personal finance K-12 to the state of Georgia. We provide professional development workshops at no financial charge to teachers or systems. And we're very specific. We're, we're grade, tense, grade specific and, and content specific. So if you're in Georgia, come to a Georgia Council, Council workshop. We will have you ready to teach economics and personal finance. And I would say the same thing across the country. Uh, there, there, are, there are councils for economic education that do this uh, in, in, in most states. There are also other very strong organizations out there doing the same thing. So the first thing I would say is look for, look for your council or one of the other partners out there. Uh, I, I just wanted to do one, um, one little shout out here as well. I think it's important. Um, uh, we, we've touched briefly on, on Visa in this, but I think the, the, the role that the corporations can play is an important one. And, and, and one of the reasons that we, you know, we, we are really seeing Visa as a, as a partner on this is the recognition that you can be talking in the halls of Congress way up here at the 100,000 foot level, but stuff happens on the ground that is critically important. And, 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 and Visa recognizes that. And there are other corporate partners we have that, that, that do the same and, and, and are putting their voice and putting their support behind making sure that teachers get that sort of education. And so supporting organizations like Mike's and like others out there who are really on the ground, in the trenches, working every day with teachers to make them confident and competent teachers of this, of this content area. Thank you. Let me just ask an add-on question to that. Are there actual set curriculum that you could deliver to a, a teacher who, who wants to do it, but maybe doesn't have time, but maybe could create a program or, or create, the, create the space in the day for it, but that you could sort of deliver to them. Yep. 
yes. so the, 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 I'll, I'll try to give the short answer, not the long answer here. Uh, there, there is some theme and variation from state to state. Um, and so that's why we're so lucky to have these councils and centers across the country because they can take kind of the, the, that national perspective or national view CE creates a ton of content, for example. There are other organizations that do the same. They can take all of that, those materials and think about how do I make this work in a, in a curriculum specific to what, the, what the, the, the standards require in my state. And so I, I really turn oftentimes to those state level organizations to say, hey, here's a bunch of great content. Now I need you to help determine how that fits exactly for your teachers in your state. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I have one, one question here. Uh, with everything that's been discussed, discussed, could you each please pick one major takeaway? So, uh, Worku, let me start with you. Put you on the hot seat. Sure, yeah. Uh, for me, I think it's just reinforcing the important work that Mike and other state affiliates are doing in training the teachers. I mean, all of this, all of our work, all the policy, all the research, right, um, really comes to, comes to fruition with teachers. And so if we're not finding ways to support them and their professional development, then we've really kind of lost our path. Okay, good hands. John, let me go to you next. Sure. So I'd say, um, and I think Mia kind of uh, uh, exemplifies this uh, more than anything, is I can't uh, overstate the value of student advocates when it comes to the creation of education policy. Uh, I, I've, I was a state legislator before I was a state treasurer. I can tell you that uh, the opinions are deeply valued by the students uh, across the country. So uh, when it comes to enacting any sort of educational policy, student advocacy is, is critical. Mike. Uh, I, I think John's point of it really is going to take bipartisanship from legislators to make things happen uh, and how important that is. And also the fact that Mia has a job with Visa. That's awesome. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> you didn't think it was going to go this way today, Mia, probably, did you? I definitely did not. But I think my <laughs> major takeaway is that First of all, like I'm a student and it's taken, like I put a lot of work into being here today and getting to this place, but you can do it when, with the support of teachers and parents. So definitely for teachers and parents, like I know my parents and my teachers have been so influential in my life and you have that power. So please inspire your students. And also that there's just, there's financial literacy is so, so important, and it's a great way to empower those who are underrepresented, such as women in finance are, it's such a small subset of people at this point, and we want that to grow. And any underrepresented group of people, giving them the opportunity to learn financial literacy is so huge. And I think that if we can advocate for that, then we can really make the world a better place. Okay, good answer. Chris. Uh, there is a lot of work to be done but there is a lot of work that has been done. And so what I would say is if, if you don't know where to start, there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of folks who have done a lot of the hard work for you already and seek them out for their advice and their experience. I think you got some of that today from, from the folks on this panel. Uh, and I would uh, end on that note by saying, you can also go to surveyofthestates.com and we actually have, as, as part of not just not just having the survey itself there, but we have um, some other uh, other resources, some toolkits, some other things that could help you get started. So a uh, lot to be done, but a lot already done that we can build off of. That's my end. end okay. Point. Let me just add one thought I had, which is uh, never underestimate the power of a small group of committed people to change the world. In fact, it is the only thing that ever has. So. To CEE, it's not such a small group anymore. It's a bigger and bigger group. But thank you for your efforts to change the world. So uh, I think that's sort of all the time we have for this. I want to bring Nan back in to, to have some closing remarks. Thanks so much to our to Karen, to our whole panel. I am so fortunate to have you all as colleagues in this effort. Karen mentioned a small group of people can make a lot of change happen but it takes people from everywhere. And I was going down our attendee list and I saw, saw members 
of our uh, representatives are affiliated councils and centers. Um, Mike's direct colleagues. I saw other educators. I saw our not-for-profit partners, uh, people from Jumpstart, NextGen, NIFI. I apologize if I've forgotten anybody. Folks from the private sector, folks from the public sector at the state and local and national level. And it, it really takes a little bit from every place to bring this all together. So uh, thank you for joining us. Please go to the survey of the states. If you've got something going in your state and you need help, please call us or your local state council or, or a center. Take a look at the National Standards for Personal Finance, newly minted with the help of Jumpstart and many others on both of our websites. Uh, we can really make this happen over the next two years so we can get everything done soon as opposed to waiting until, as Chris said, the middle of the the this next uh, century. Thank you all so much for joining us. And uh, we look forward to spending time with many of you over the next bit. Thanks again.